okay. Uh, welcome everyone to the CGDG Computational Genetics Discussion, discussion Group. Uh, as discussed in the last meeting, uh, Lorraine is leaving and now we have a new team um, organized by myself, Leticia Lara, Julian Frederick and Ivan Pocknick. We have this huge responsibility to keep the, the presentations great as Lorena have been done in the past few years. And for our first meeting, it is a pleasure to introduce Rodrigo Amadeu. I'm very happy to, to have met and worked with him when he was doing his undergraduate studies in agronomy and his master's studies in genetics and plant breeding at the University of Sao Paulo with Professor Augusto Garcia. In 2014, he did an internship at the University of Florida with Professor Patricio Munoz. And in 2018, he moved there to do his PhD focusing on auto polyploids and plant breeding. Rodrigo is a brilliant researcher who works with the development of statistical genetic software for polyploids, just as AJ8 matrix and DiKTL. Today, he will tell us about KTL mapping in auto tetraploid species and the implementation of this methodology in the software DiKTL, which is a collaboration with Professor Jeffrey Endelman from the University of Wisconsin. Thank you, Rodrigo, to present your work with, for us. And uh, if you are okay, I, I can stop you over the presentation to, to do some questions if we have those in the chat. So you have the you have the talk. Okay, thanks for the kind words, Leticia. Yeah, feel free to uh, stop me during my presentation and ask questions. And okay, thanks for the invitation. And today I'll be here uh, talking about QTL mapping in tetraploid dialect populations. Uh, my name is Rodrigo Madeo. I'm a PhD candidate at the University of Florida in the Horticultural Science Department. Okay, so let's talk about the context of this work. So we usually in plant breeding, you have two types of populations. One that's called the breeding population where you do actual breeding. And then you have a separate population that you do discovery. Usually those discovery populations can be represented by a GWASP uh, diversity panel or some big biparental population where you are crossing contrasting parents for some trait. And then you do discovery in those populations and you try to transfer the knowledge and the QTLs on those populations for your breeding population. And the breeding population in our case here is based on a recurrent selection. And you have a lot of small families that are somehow connected. For example, they share one or the other parent and they can be like first cousins, second cousins and so on. This is the common uh, framework of breeding programs in clonally propagated and outcrossing, especially in out polyploids. And this is like uh, potato, uh, blueberry, and different forests. And what about if you can, for example, change the paradigm here? Instead of having specific uh, discovery populations, how about if you can use in somehow our current breeding populations to do discovery. And this is the context of this work is try to propose new methodologies to do discovery in the actual uh, breeding populations that we do have in autopolyploids. And for that, you need to understand the structure of the populations in the current, that we do have in the breeding programs, potato and blueberry in this case, and they can be represented by dialect populations. Let's uh, talk about, about what is a DLL population. So a DLL can be represented by a cross of four parents with the same set of four parents. And each square here represents a full seed family. In the diagonal have the selves, for example, here you have A by A cross. In the off diagonal have one direction of the cross. So this family has uh, parent A as a mom and parent D as a uh, dad. And here you have the reciprocal, so D as a mom and A as a dad. This is a full DLL. So if you have all the possible full seed families, you're gonna have a full DLL. 
And then you can have partial dialogues. You can have half dialogues with selves, half dialogues with no selves. Here in Blueberries, in the Blueberry Bridging Program, we have this scheme here. This is a circular matching design. So you have a cross of A and B, and then you take one of the parent B and cross with another one with C, and then you take C, cross with another one with D, and so on, and then you, you close the, the circle at the end with D and A cross. This is what we do, we do every year in the bridging program in Blueberries. In Potato, for example, they use a factorial matching design where you have a set of parents uh, used as a dad, as the male uh, donor, and then you have a set of different parents used as a mom. So if you have a methodology to do uh, haplotype reconstruction, considering these different pedigrees, we can then do, use uh, do QTL mapping in those type of populations. Um, let's take a look at how you can do haplotype reconstruction in a single full sieve family. So just in one square here in this scheme. Uh, uh, in auto polyploids, the most used software and like a groundbreaker breaking software is the one called tetraploid map. Uh, probably if you work with tetraploids or other auto polyploids, you have heard about this software. It was released in 2003 by Christine Hackett, also from Scotland. And this software was based on dominant and co-dominant markers as microsatellites and AFLP, RFLP. And only in 2015 and 16, and after that, that you have the first proper methods to do haplotype reconstruction in using SNPs. This software, for example, released by Charles Itzang, the tetraploid uh, tetra region, do that considering a high density uh, genotyping procedure. And in the mapping uh, language, uh, you say that you are doing phasing. It's the same thing as haplotype reconstruction. And after this software, I also have another software release in 19 by Molinari and Garcia that do this for higher ploid levels. And what's the idea of this type of software of this haplotype reconstruction? They usually require a biparental cross where you know the genotype of the parents. And then the software does this phasing or the haplotype reconstruction. Here in this example, uh, and usually the software are based on some hidden Markov models. So you have the known information, the information that you see is the dosage of the marker. And then you try to predict the hidden information, which is the haplotype in a longitudinal way because the recombination of a given marker is related somehow with the recombination of the next marker and so on. And that's the idea of the software. So you have this input, Let's say that here you have one for a given SNP for different individuals, you have the dosage of the SNPs. You are working with auto tetraploids here. So the dosage can be from zero to four. So it's how many alternative alleles you have for this SNP for this individual. And as output, you have the presence or absence of a given haplotype. For example, this first individual here it has inherited the first haplotype of the first parent and the third haplotype of the first parent and then the two first haplotypes of the second parent. So you can have this type of output in terms of haplotypes, uh, presence or absence. If you are using probability to have, you can have the probabilities to have inherited a given haplotype or the other haplotype. And with this uh, haplotype reconstruction, we can do QTL mapping. Uh, for example, this for example, this method proposed by Pereira in last last year called QTL poly, you do a regression of your phenotype. Let's say that you have some disease score like area under the curve progression here in the y-axis, and you use your haplotype reconstruction as covariates, so you can do the regression. There are different ways to do this regression. In this software specifically, they are building a genomic relationship matrix like a kernel for each uh, locus. 
and to use this kernel uh, in a linear mix model to model for the QTL effect in a as a random term. Other ways to do that is using, there are different ways to do QTL mapping in a single bi-parental populations as the ones implemented in tetraploid snip map and polymap R. Okay, so how about multi-parental, uh, if you have multiple biparental populations? So right now there is no way to do that using uh, those haplotype reconstructions, but uh, this type of populations are really common in breeding programs. So like here in the blueberry breeding program, we have a lot of small populations that are connected somehow. And using those types of populations, you would be investigating a larger genetic background. So it's your QTL, your finds, things that in this study, in those using those type of populations, likely you'll be likely to be transferable for your breeding population. This is our common uh, gap in traditional QTL mapping studies using biparental populations is the QTL transferability, the lack of but there is a lack of methodology for autopolyploids and anti-crossing. And here's the goal of this work is to develop method and software to do QTL mapping in those types of populations. And this goal is within a grant, a USDA grant uh, led by Dr. Endemann that is the PI from Wisconsin Madison. It has as my, as co-PI Dr. Munoz, my advisor here at the University of Florida, and Dr. Zhang from Wang University. And two outputs of this grant is one software to do haplotype reconstruction, uh, considering the LL populations, and a software to do QTL mapping, considering the LL populations. They both, soft, both softwares uh, have the preprint already available in BioArchive. So let's uh, talk about the context of multi-parental QTL mapping. So we do have multi-parental QTL mapping in inbreds. This is really common. We have methods to do uh, QTL mapping in biparental populations of inbreds using the North Carolina uh, designs and different types of designs. Uh, more recently, we have some new types of populations being proposed as uh, nested association mapping populations, magic populations, heterogeneous stock populations in mice. And all of them requires the founders to be inbreds. And this is not the reality. This is not possible in out polyploids usually. And all of those types of, of populations have a red software to do this analysis as RQTL2 by Carbromon. And if you are working with outcrossing autopolyploid species, we can do uh, QTL mapping using like just a single microaggression or using pedigree methods. And pedigree methods are usually, usually has a low power and requires really big populations. And as alternative here, we are proposing a new methodology to consider the dialectal structure. The dialect population I already mentioned. And the haplotype reconstruction part uh, was led for dialects, was led by Charles Itzeng. He proposed a new uh, update, a new version, upgrade of the Tetra region software. And is based on the, the ideas of Tetra region, but now have a new layer of complexity, which is the pedigree of the population in the hidden Markov model. And the softwares are already available in this website and also the preprint. And what's the idea of this software? So as before, you have the input. Now you have a pedigree in your input. So here you have like a dialogue of three by three parents. And then using the software, you're gonna have a matrix of the haplotype reconstruction of each SNP for each uh, individual. For example, for this, for one marker, you can track which haplotypes each individual has and from what parent. For example, here, individual one and two are from the first two parents, A and B, and individual three and four are from another cross, A and C. And then 
the QTL idea, the QTL mapping idea is to use this information and do some type of a regression to estimate additive effects for each locus. And then you can do that uh, like in an interval mapping, do like for each locus and then have a profile of this effect doing a regression against some phenotypic records. Okay, this is the idea how you are modeling this problem is with this linear mixed model in a, where you have the response variable, your disease score, your uh, quantitative trait here. And then the user can provide some covariates in the model. There is this flexibility. You can have a uh, block effects, ear effects, some location effect environment, or the age of the plant that you are working with. And this summation here is the core of our model. So basically here, this W, you have the haplotype probabilities of inherited the first uh, haplotype of the first parent and the second haplotype of the first parent and so on until the last parent and the last haplotype. And then the alpha is the effect of each haplotype that you have in the population. And if you can compute the probability to have inherited a given haplotype of a given parent, you can also compute the probability to have inherited a group of two haplotypes or a group of three haplotypes or a group of four haplotypes. With those groups, you can estimate uh, dominance effects as digenic dominance, trigenic dominance, and quadrigenic dominance. We also include like uh, polygenic uh, effect here to control for polygenic background, modeling based on a genomic relationship matrix using all the other uh, haplotype probabilities that are not being scanned for this locus. And you fit this model for every locus and then gonna have a profile of the QTL presence in the, for the genome. We are fitting this model in a Bayesian context uh, using the machinery of another software called BGLR. Here is the reference by the Los Campos. And for the alpha term, the genetic effect of the haplotypes, you are assuming a mixture uh, prior density uh, called as BC, where you have some effects shrunk towards zero and some other effects drawn from normal distribution. This allows some flexibility, so you can have some alleles that has no effects or some alleles for a given parent, parent with no effects at all which is a, a, a good assumption in, in a multi-parental uh, scheme. And the other effects are, we just assume normal prior density. We did some optimization of the number of burning and iterations using CODA software. Okay, and some other features of, we, we took that model and we implemented in this software called the IOQTL and some features of this software is open source R package. It's based on the QTL poly software that I just showed from Pereira. And it's basically basically an expansion of that software to include uh, this dialectic stru structure and also to include dominance effects. But here we are just doing a regression one, one marker at a time while in Pereira in QTL poly, we are doing a multiple interval mapping. And the regression has some model flexibility. We implement some parallel computation for, to speed up the process. And as output, the user would have LOG scores and delta, uh, the deviations of the DIC, which is the information criteria of the uh, Bayesian model that you're feeding of a model with the QTL against the model without the QTL presence. So with that summation and without that summation, and you're gonna also have some thresholds to detect the significance of the QTL, also the estimated effects. And we backed all the software development, development with simulations. So let's take a look on some simulation results of our software. We did, uh, first we did simulations to detect uh, LOD threshold to control for false positive rate. So we simulate different scenarios, different genomes and populations with no QTL. And then what's the threshold to control for 
false positive rate at 5%, for example. Each simulation, each point here represents a uh, thousand independent uh, simulations. You can see here that as we increase genome size, we need a higher LOG threshold to control for this FPR rate. As we increase the number of parents, we also need a higher LOG threshold. As we increase ploidy level, also need a higher LOG threshold. Number of parents here is the number of parents used in a half DLL. We didn't find any difference of using a full DLL or half DLL or circular mating design DLL. And another in, uh, thing that you did is what's the power of our method? So what's the probability to detect the QTL uh, based on a population with a QTL in a given position? So here is that probability to detect in terms of population size. So we consider those different population size, 200 individuals, 400 individuals, 800 individuals. This is the total population size. And with different ploidy levels and different number of parents in the half DLL with different heritability. You can see that as we increase population size, we increase power to detect the QTL. As we increase QTL, heritability also increase power. And here we have some interesting results is that you can see that different population configurations, you have a higher power to detect the QTL. For example, in this case, instead of using a big dial population of 800 individuals, you can instead use a four by four half dial population with similar power. And in that way, with the similar resource allocation. So we'll be investigating a more diverse population in this case with our method with similar power. And this trend uh, and this observation was also true for accuracy of the haplotype effects that we estimate in the model. Also the distance to the uh, real position of the QTL and all of those statistics were correlated with the number of progeny per parental haplotype which is basically the sampling size at the parental haplotype level. Uh, we also did some real data analysis with our software using a real potato a population from the breeding program from Wisconsin Madison, led by Dr. Endemann. And this population is a three by three half DLL with 400 individuals. They genotype with SNP array. And they're interested here in tuber shape, which is the length of the tuber by width. So if you are breeding for round shaped tubers for the chip market, for example, you want more uh, low ratio of length by width. If you are breeding for elongated tuber, like for French fries, you want a high ratio uh, length, width, length width ratio. Okay, and we screen, we use that model for every position in the genome. And we found this really nice peak here in the chromosome 10. And this is, this was expected because this peak is already known in the literature in previous studies in other populations. And then we end to that peak in that marker and you estimate the additive effects for the haplotypes. So th those three here are the parents used to build this half DLL population. And here you can see that the fourth haplotype of this parent has a really negative effect for this trait. So if you are breeding for round shaped tubers, you can select individuals with this fourth haplotype in the genome. For example, this individual here is offspring of this parent and it has that haplotype and it has two copies of that haplotype due to a double reduction. And here in the traced line is the location of the QTL. So if you select for this if you select this individual for the next breeding cross, uh, breeding cross, breeding cycle, sorry, you're gonna be using marker assisted selection more in a more modern way to select for this haplotype. And we also have in the software some fine visualization for this for this haplotype, for example. This uh, represents the position in the genome, the marker name here, and then which individuals has a recombination in that part of the genome. So 
maybe it's a good idea to avoid to select those individuals to for this trait. So you can use that to guide your selection criteria for this haplotype. And you can also investigate the genetic architecture of that locus. So in the model, you can fit the, a model with just the additive effects of each haplotype. We fit that model, we found some polygenic heritability of 0.37. And here's the heritability, the additive heritability for that QTL. And here is the GIC, the information criteria. And then we can also fit uh, higher order uh, terms in this model, like diagenic, trigenic, quadrigenic. And in our modeling strategy, the diagenic model also includes additive. So we are modeling uh, an asset effect here. Okay, so this model, the additive model is nested in the diagenic model. And here you can see that when we consider diagenic effects, we have a really drop, a high drop in the DIC. So it means that this model has a better fitness than the previously model. And here you can see that you have some diagenic heritability also. And it, when we, we try to fit trigenic and quadrigenic effects, we don't have a better model fitness. So you can, using, you can use this model selection approach to investigate genetic architecture. In this case, you have a QTL with diagenic effects and you can also compute the broad sense heritability. In this case, it was 0.77. Let's see now the effects of those diagenic uh, dominance, of this diagenic dominance. We can compute what's the effect of each pair of haplotype in, the, in your population. For example, here haplotype, the fourth haplotype of this parent with the second haplotype of village rose negatively impacts our phenotypic, uh, our phenotype, our phenotype. So, you can go and select individuals that has this combination of haplotypes in the population. And in the lower diagonal have the total uh, effect of this, of this combination. So it's the diagenic dominance effects plus the additive effects. And it's worth noticing that diagenic effects are inherited in polyploids. So you can inherit a group of two haplotypes, for example, and use that for breeding. And the next steps in our software is to implement a, a two-dimensional scan. So basically in that previously model, we're gonna have two summations for different uh, locus, different loci, and also is to investigate categorical traits. So in our simulations, we just uh, assume quantitative traits and how about categorical traits, how our model would perform using them. And also to, include higher ploid levels. This is a different output of the software. You can also output the genome scan in terms of the deviation, the GIC. Some conclusions. Now we do have a new methodology in software to do QTL mapping out of tetraploids. With, based on the simulations, we have more diverse populations instead of just one single biparental population. So you can have a flexibility in the population design for QTL mapping. The software is available in this GitHub page. There is a companion software to do all the simulations called PageGreeSync which is a R workup of a software called PageGreeSync, the citations over here. And our manuscript is under review right now. And the software is being already used. So in this paper, we are um, showing the data analysis that I just showed you here about for tuber shape. And there is a just released uh, article that screen late blight resistance uh, in a QTL study uh, led by Dr. Engelman. And right now we are doing uh, QTL mapping for anthracnose resistance in blueberry in a four by four LL population. And let's go back in the first slide. What's the impact of our software? So basically in the Blueberry Bridging Program, we have a circular mating design. So we do a circular mating design every year and apply some recurrent selection. And then with this circular mating, you have about 150 crosses with about 15 to 20 individuals each cross, each family. 
And right now have a different population that is our discover population, can be a GWAS, a diversity panel, or some big biparental population. With this software, we will, in the next uh, few years, remove this type of populations in the breeding program. And instead of that, take some of those families, increase the number of individuals per family, uh, double the number of individuals, so you gonna uh, reduce the selection intensity of some families that you have interest at, that have some trait that you see that are, is segregating and use this type of population as a discovery in the same pipeline of our breeding program. This will reduce cost of maintaining big biparent populations or to maintain uh, diversity panels, for example. And that's it. Thank you all for your attention and I'll be glad to take any questions and if you are working with polyploids, check this website here that has different tools and a lot of tutorials. Thank you. Great talk, uh, Rodrigo. Thank you very much. So while the people are thinking for possible questions, I, I have one myself. Um, this uh, methodology, this DIKTL, it's great to expand uh, the from biparental populations for uh, multiple biparental, uh, for uh, it's a extension, uh, uh, very useful. And I would like to know if you are planning to extend for high ploidies, uh, for species with more than four uh, ploidy levels. Yeah, this is one of the to do things in the list. Uh, the problem right now is that we need first to expand the haplotype reconstruction for the multiple, uh, for higher ploidy levels. And then you can use this expansion also in, the, in your software. So first thing is you need to have this haplotype reconstruction in higher ploidies for multiple parental populations. If you don't have that, which is the scenario right now, you can use like a map poly software to do this haplotype for each each family and then use that information to do QTL mapping. But you need to expand your software. And if you're interested in that, you can like do mm -hmm. some partnership and verify that and you expand your software. But it's in your to-do list. You're just looking for collaborations because potato and blueberry are tetraploid, so you don't have interest right now. Okay, get it. Uh, and uh, how is the communication? Uh, how is the communication uh, among the softwares like uh, DiKTL communicate well with, with uh, Poly Orange, but is it communicate well with Map Poly or other softwares as well? Um, not right now, but there. Are I have some functions that I need to implement in, the, in your software to communicate with MapPoly. I guess this is mm -hmm. also in your to-do list, but you're going to have to implement that. Mm -hmm. But the, the problem is that the MapPoly is just uh, considered just one bivariant population. So you need to have yes. the information across multiple parental populations. So that could yeah. be an issue to implement this transferability. But you can do, uh, you can use our software just to do QTL mapping a single biparental population. Okay. But Thank I implement you. that. It is, I have the codes, just not implemented. <laughs> Good. Yeah. Great. Thank you very much. Uh, any, any question? Let's wait a little bit for more people. I think they are a little bit shy. <laughs> Well, while uh, no one is asking, I also have another one. <laughs> uh, sure. Rodrigo, uh, we know that um, <laughs> we know that in map polling, uh, gen uh, genotype errors, it's very uh, relevant. For example, for ma 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 uh, constructing mapping, uh, mapping um, linkage mapping, it can give us inflated maps. Uh, how the genotype errors are affecting the QTL detection, and uh, are you considered this information? Do you have this to-do list as uh, as well to include in the future? 
Uh, no, uh, we are not considering. We consider that the haplotypes are like deterministic, so we don't have this error in our simulations. Uh, but we consider those errors mm -hmm. in the poly origin uh, methodology. So in the simulations for the poly origin software, we consider those errors. And the method, the poly origin method uh, was really robust against those errors in the, those genotyping errors. So based on that, we could infer that those pro, uh, genotyping errors would not affect that much our methodology because the haplotype reconstruction is robust enough to, for genotyping, genotyping errors. This is mainly because you have the hidden Markov model borrowing information across the, mm -hmm. the locus. So a given genotypic error okay. will be correct by the, by the neighbors. But you are not considering so if, that. So if you control if if you control before, it will not affect the the detection of KTLs. All right. Uh, I will. You, of course, you will reduce a little bit the power, but you, I will, don't believe you have a high impact. Mm -hmm. uh, in the polar region, we showed that you can use like a really low reading depth, like 10, 15 uh, x, and even though you have a good uh, probabilistic reconstruction of the haplotypes. So if you have a robust method for this type of reading depth, I don't believe that that will impact QTL mapping. But you need to check with simulations. You need to, in simulation uh, studies, need to you have a, several possible uh, possibilities of, of scenarios. So you That's chose true. to not consider that. <laughs> The scenarios grow fast, right? Yes. <laughs> the possibilities to test everything. Yeah. Yes. Okay, great. Um, anyone else have any question? Uh, Felipe, are you muted? Uh, we cannot hear you. Hello, everyone. Can you hear me? No. Nope. Uh, yes. Yes, now we can. Hello, yes, Rodrigo. Yes. Hello, Leticia. Can I make Can I make a question? Uh, yes. Sure. So <laughs> now, um, so one of the the main results for this software is, is because we can definitely use that for marker seed selection, but now we are not targeting uh, anymore single markers, but also the the target uh, is the apple type, correct? So I was wondering, Rodrigo, if one of the discussions with the potato team and, all the, and also with other um, people that are working with polyploids, so how this could change our um, genotype platform, you know, if we have to focus on, on, on those kind of genotyping approach that you can target like long reads or something like that. Um, did you discuss about that? Um, not really, but... One of the discussions was like, you can still do gene discovery using the current platforms with SNPs and then do the haplotype reconstruction. And then you do like a fine genotyping of that region only, and then reconstruct the haplotype. So you can have long read sequences for a target region and then use that information to, to do marker assisted selection. That would be a possibility, but we are not in discussing that in the arteries like beyond the scope, but that, that would be one, one possible alternative or solution for that. It's a good, a good point. Thank you, guys. Thank you, Felipe. OK, uh, yeah, if you, we do not have any more questions, uh, uh, I will finish the meeting. Thank you very much, uh, Rodrigo, to, to this great talk. And see you all next meeting. Thank you. Have a nice evening. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.